Okay. There we go. There was, uh, let everyone know we are recording. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. Jumping right back into the action. <clears throat> Impact of isotonic and isometric exercise on cardiovascular function. First things first. He's going to give you straight definitions. Isotonic versus isometric versus iso kinetic isotonic same tone isometric same length isokinetic same speed um, special machine required for isokinetic isotonic exercises maintains same force or tone throughout the same length no actual movement of the muscles <clears throat> okay um do, 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 do. what is the impact of exercise on the cardiovascular Function. It's a weird way to word that. Let me pull up. This was week 11. Actually, I think I already have this pulled up. Let me... okay. Isometric. Do -do 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 -do. I'm just going to read through the lab really quick and highlight a couple things that make sure that you need to know. This part right here, hypertension, isometric exercise. Makes blood pressure go high. So do not do it if you have high blood pressure. So this will this will be a test question. You'll have a patient that said the patient has this blood pressure, whatever. What type of exercise would you recommend that they do? <clears throat> if you uh, do, do, do. if you have high blood pressure, get into cardio first, isotonic stuff. Okay. That's always, always, always a test question. Uh, uh, pulse transducer. Sonometer calibration and record. I'm in recovery. Okay, so here's magic exercise is defined as a sim simultaneous isometric contraction of all skeletal muscle groups by attempting to lift or move an immovable object, such as a laboratory bench. Make sure, yes, okay. <clears throat> so all of this stuff we observed for the diastolic blood pressure, this is the big thing. So isometric exercise. Under you need to understand blood pressures. Isometric. Both blood pressures rise. Isotonic. Systolic only goes up. Diastolic may go up slightly or even go down. These are the kind of test questions. You will see the kind of questions you'll see on this test. Comparing, you'll see a lot of like comparison questions between the two. Um, recovery was isometric, faster. Largest pulse pressures, isotonic. <laughs> Heart rate, stroke, volume, chronic output increase. Isometric, uh, yeah.
I want this graph. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know what the heck is supposed to mean like cardiovascular function. My guess is it's just referring to like the cardiovascular system, but <clears throat> all of these correct. Um, and actually, I want to make sure. Oh, there's a couple little details. So overall, you get increased blood flow. Overall, you get um, increased blood flow to the active muscles, but with severe isometric exercise, the muscles, um, they sort of clamp off the vessels. So you don't get as much blood flow as well as blood pressure changes at these in here <clears throat> isotonic versus isometric isotonic um, increased largely increased pulse pressure so we get systolic goes way high diastolic stays the same slash dips a little with isotonic so do this type of exercise first if you have high blood pressure isometric um, pulse pressure about stays the same systolic and diastolic go high avoid if you have high blood pressure <clears throat> kind of the general um this is super important to know this is important you know the blood pressure changes other than that, yeah, all that the rest is is the same. Uh, what are the sympathetic actions directly on the heart and the vasculature? Um, specifically, when we talk about sympathetic actions, the sympathetic nervous system, right? Let me double check something real quick. Yeah, that's what I want. Okay, so the sympathetic nervous system um, releases our norepinephrine. So these are some of the stuff. I'm going to kind of go a little bit more broad because I'm not entirely sure what he's going to ask you about. So the sympathetic releases our norepinephrine. Um, activation of sympathetic nervous system does the following you get increased heart rate increased contractility <clears throat> and vasoconstriction of vessels mm. Not actually a little bit different. Um, check. So with the vessels, there's kind of a separation between the two. So it can cause both vasoconstriction and vasodilation. It depends on where we are looking. It causes vasoconstriction 
in the skin, the digestive system. So think stomach, intestines. Um, and then also the kidneys. So all of this stuff that, you know, like, isn't mandatory. We don't need to digest or do anything like that. Um, when we have sympathetic nervous system activation, vasodilation within the muscles that are active. Um, muscles that are active, so the skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. I'm going to also add in here, you also get bronchodilation and you get pupil dilation. Those probably won't be asked because you're just focusing on the heart and vasculature, but it's good to have in there. Any questions about sympathetic nervous system? Activation? Nope, okay. moving on. What are the local responses of the tissue that promote blood flow? So other than just like general vasodilation, I want to go into what is actually causing the local vasodilation. Those are actually causing the local vasodilation. So. I don't think he has it down here below. Okay. I think we've talked about this before, um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> not in this session. So the local response of the tissue that promote blood flow, you get vasodilation, but the way that you get vasodilation is through the release of a whole bunch of the different substances and different chemical changes within the tissue. So there's kind of like a couple opposites of each other. So you have decreased oxygen, and on the other side, increased CO2. Um, increase in lactic acid, decrease in pH, you have um, increase in extra, oh, uh, what's the word? Extra, let's just say extra cellular potassium, decrease in extra cellular sodium. Um, I think there was another one. Might be uh, there. Was, I think there's at least one or two more. But anyways, <clears throat> these all of these things, and then I guess you also have um, sympathetic nervous system activation of um, receptors. So all of these things are, I'd say these three are more the local response. This is the global response. Um, does that make sense when I say local versus global response? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so these things, when we have low CO2, increased CO2, more lactic acid, all of these things, stimulate the area around it to cause you know to for vasodilation to occur break get more blood flow there have the blood actually move slower through that specific tissue in order to get um everything go everything in and out that it needs to <clears throat> um, there are specific words I remember which ones are which. So there are these big words they call ionotropic. 
tropic, and this is chronotropic, I believe. Let me double check. You ever heard those words before? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. Again, I'm going to give it to you just because I never know with him. Um, chrono, chrono meaning time, um, tropic being change. So changing in the timing of the heart. Iono, I actually don't know what the root of Iono means. Actor process, I don't know. It's ionotropic for changing contractility. Um, and I believe there's a third one, but the third one's not super important because otherwise I'd remember it. So uh, just a couple extra words. In, I'm not sure if he'll include those for that in the test, but in case he does, <clears throat> you have those words in the back of your mind. Okay. How does the sympathetic nervous system result in an increase in heart rate and stroke volume to support exercise? So the sympathetic nervous system goes and it connects to the SA node. Diastole this increases heart rate. Yeah, essentially because <clears throat> the SA node is typically, you know, um, it has autorhythmicity. So it has its autorhythmic cells. Basically, the the nerve just goes, and this what this is saying is, in simpler terms, the nerve increases the speed of activation of the SA node to increase heart rate. <clears throat> so you get activation of myocardium, some more contractility leading to increased stroke volume, um, means less blood. I think it's called residual, less residual volume left in the left ventricle. And the release of epinephrine and norepinephrine leads that increased heart rate. Norepinephrine and epinephrine, remember these are aka adrenaline and nor adrenaline. <clears throat> they basically do the same thing, just slightly different origin points usually. So uh, know the receptors that respond to sympathetic input these are the questions i personally hate because this is the one where it always got mixed up in my brain one sec so <clears throat> the receptors that respond to sympathetic input alpha adrenergic receptors vasoconstrict the beta is increased heart rate and contractility. Let me, I'm going to double check these just because I'm not 100% confident in all of these. The activation of the alpha adrenergic receptors in blood vessels can cause vasoconstriction, which is the main effect on smooth muscle cells. This can lead to decreased blood flow to organs like the skin, brain, kidney, and gastrointestinal system during the fight or flight response. For example, when someone is frightened, their skin may appear pale due to vasoconstriction. Okay, so our Alpha adrenergic receptors 
vasoconstriction again in the smooth muscle of vessels and also other organs like the skin, kidney, GI tract. <clears throat> the beta adrenergic receptors Elizabeth, this part right here, is this something that you found in the actual um, lecture type material, or is this just kind of Googling and going off and looking up stuff? Just looking stuff up. Okay. Okay, so this one, so the vascular response, <clears throat> the beta adrenergic receptors will cause vasodilation for the vascular response, and then cardiac response is the increased heart rate and contractility. How does increased sympathetic input on veins affect cardiac function? So we know that the veins are a lot of smooth. Uh, yeah. Veins affect cardiac function, vasoconstriction, which increases venous return. Skeletal muscle pump, increased venous, venous return, compressing veins during muscle contraction. Pushes blood back to the heart, increases venous return, which leads to increased cardiac output. <clears throat> How does exercise impact heart rate, isometric or isotonic? Again, a, not really a difference between those two. It's going to heart rate is increase. How does exercise impact stroke volume? Again, they both increase. Are changes exclusively exclusively related to venous return? No, because you have the sympathetic nervous system. You have, um, yeah, it's simply the nervous system. You have increased contractility and increased heart rate <clears throat> play a role too. How does exercise impact cardiac output? They both increase cardiac output. Yep. How does exercise impact venous return? Again, they both increase it. How does it affect mean arterial pressure? They, they do both increase mean arterial pressure. Big difference. Yeah, the next question down below. So it said answers it. The isometric exercise increases mean arterial pressure more than isotonic exercise due to the sustained muscle contraction. Yeah, and then what we said, what we mentioned above with how each changes systolic slash diastolic blood pressures. A lot of this, like a lot of this should be pretty straightforward. Just you know, if you do any exercise, the heart rate's going to increase, blood pressure goes up. Like, 
it's hopefully a little just intuitive. How does skeletal muscle blood flow differ between isometric and isotonic? Limits of delivery. Yep. All of this looks good. It limits the blood flow due to sustained contraction. Limits the O2 delivery. I would just include both of those. Increases peripheral resistance because the muscles are contracting and pressing into the vessels. With isotonic, you get limited blood flow during contraction, increased blood flow during relaxation. Yeah. Isotonic, there's less impact to blood flow and blood pressure with isotonic exercise than there is with isometric. I feel like a lot of these questions are now repeating. Yep. Okay, any questions in general about isometric versus isotonic type exercises? Pretty straightforward. Yeah, it should be pretty straightforward. Um, let's see if there's anything else in this lab that this is the other lab. Um, doesn't look like he'll ask you a question about maximum heart rate. This is all info stuff. Oh, did I ever? I don't think I top pasted that. Um, yeah, let me grab this guy so we can see, like in general, with isotonic. You know, we don't have that as severe. <clears throat> this line, I think, is a little bit off. This line should go up a little bit because with a bigger gap, you are getting an increased amount. But these two graphs kind of give you all of the information that you that you need for answering these kind of questions. Notice, you know, like the change in pulse pressure, massive change in pulse pressure here, almost no change in pulse pressure with isometric, all this kind of stuff. Okay. Autonomic nervous system and cardiac function. Mm. You guys get to see my my OCD mentalities come out with making sure things are lined up properly. I spent 20 minutes trying to do it and got frustrated and gave up. <laughs> it's, and that's kind of when I stopped filling it out because I was like, it doesn't look right and I'm done. It's gonna make me do this whole thing. Let me do this. Continue numbering. Let me just take this. We start at one. I know all of the tricks. Is if you have my notes, I'm sure you see. I'm a little bit obsessive with how everything 
is organized. And the further along in the program that I got, you'll notice this if you continue to use my notes, is that they get more and more strictly organized as the program goes on. <laughs> okay. The two divisions of the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Sympathetic is known as our fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. How does the structure differ between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems? So this terminology gets tested on and it's often confusing. What you need to remember is that it's the, the parasympathetic nervous system Nerves go from the spine and travel close to the affected organ before synapsing. So essentially, the synapse is next to the affected organ. So that means our parasympathetic has long preganglionic for synapsing with the ganglia. So long preganglionic and short postganglionic. If you can just remember this one part <clears throat> with the parasympathetic nervous system it synapses right next to the affected organ if you can 100 percent lock that in to your brain then you'll know that the sympathetic is the opposite of the parasympathetic nervous system okay so that's the biggest rather than memorizing that whole Oh, short preganglionic, long postganglionic, all that yuck. Just remember this one component <clears throat> and that they're opposites of each other. Symp the, so the sympathetic nervous system overall, what is the neurotransmitter released at the varicosity? I hate these vocab words. Here. It's a weird way. Okay. For my own sanity, I'm going to varicosity. is are the bulges in the axons of the autonomic nervous system neurons that release the neurotransmitters to smooth muscles. <clears throat> As if he had worded that that way on a test, I'm going to be honest, I would have been like, I don't know what that means. I actually had to add varicosity in there based on the next question, because he had literally just said what a neurotransmitter is released. And I was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> next. So what type of receptor is stimulated by the neurotransmitter released at the varicosity? Why don't they just say the...
That's weird. Whatever. Um, what type of receptors? What what type of receptors stimulated by the neurotransmitter released at the varicosity? Adrenergic receptors. Adrenergic is just a fancy way of saying norepinephrine. So. <clears throat> so literally the definition of it relating to or denoting nerve cells in which epinephrine norepinephrine or a similar substance acts as a neurotransmitter so anytime you see adrener adrenergic receptors it just means epinephrine or norepinephrine and actually up here above norepinephrine slash epinephrine as well <clears throat> what neurotransmitter is released at the ganglion and what receptor does it stimulate? Okay, the way he has all this worded is very confusing. I'm going to do this a more a simpler way to understand this. Um, just do... <clears throat> Got a lot of stuff in here. I'm just going to do this. Actually, this way, <clears throat> move over to the bottom here, those, and add this in here. Okay, so what all of these words and crap are saying is that with the sympathetic nervous system, we have our preganglionic neuron. And in order to synapse with the postganglionic neuron, it releases acetylcholine. The postganglionic neuron goes to its target organ and releases epinephrine or norepinephrine, and that affects the organ. Parasympathetic nerves go from the central nervous system. They have the long preganglionic neuron. And they eventually synapse close to the target organ, and they synapse with acetylcholine. And then the <clears throat> postganglionic neuron also releases acetylcholine. That's what you need to know. There's a lot of yucky nerd blah blah all the way up here about all this, <clears throat> but that all of these words and all of this is literally just saying what I just said. <clears throat> Both preganglionic neurons release acetylcholine, and then the postganglionic neuron of sympathetic releases norepinephrine or epinephrine, and the postganglionic of the parasympathetic still releases acetylcholine. And that's like what you're going to be tested on when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, muscarinic means the neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. I'm going to have to fix the rest of this stuff first, but... Billion nicotinic receptors, adrenergic. This is all the stuff that we talked about. 
the arterial response to the receptor being stimulated. Did he have nicotinic in here as part of it, or is that just something you added? I put it in there uh, for the acetylcholine, but then, like, I couldn't find anything about, like, the responses. And so I was like, uh, I don't know. So the nicotinic, from what I remember, nicotinic receptors, um, like nicotinic muscarinic, I'll get to those in a sec. Nicotinic are found in both sympathetic and parasympathetic. Um, yeah, nicotinic receptors, Sorry, receptors are what um, acetylcholine binds to. So the post ganglion ganglion um, neuron of the sympathetic nervous system Please. <clears throat> has nicotinic receptors to activate yeah to activate that post ganglion ganglion neuron. So weird, funky words. Does that um, does that make sense? The nicotinic receptors. So if I were to say it, so this right here on this ganglion cell has nicotinic receptors. The target organ has nicotinic receptors. This right here, this um, the ganglion cell of the sympathetic, the sympathetic ganglion. This has nicotinic receptors. These are adrenergic receptors. The nicotinic, mm, nicotinic, nicotinic, adrenergic. And let me double check. It's kind of like in biochemistry where you have a whole bunch of. Um, words that all kind of mean the same thing. OK. So these are muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. Actually, when I get to the to, um, and these are just these are G protein coupled receptors involved in the parasympathetic nervous system. And then also technically, you could technically also put here again, I'll come back and fix this and make it all pretty. You could also technically put here um, nicotinic because pre ganglionic to post ganglionic is nicotinic receptor. Sorry, that was kind of a lot. Like I said, I, I hate the receptors, <laughs> I always have. So, uh, what? Okay, let's go. Yeah, it's like I said, there's a lot of words here. 
just remember this is what we want to remember. Preganglionic neuron. At the very end, it releases acetylcholine. <clears throat> it binds to nicotinic receptors. It continues the signal. It releases more acetylcholine, which then binds to muscarinic receptors on the target organ. In the sympathetic nervous system, short preganglionic neuron, we have a nicotinic. Uh, we release acetylcholine and we have a nicotinic receptor on the sympathetic ganglion. We have postganglionic neuron that then releases norepinephrine or epinephrine, which then goes and binds onto adrenergic receptors. I know it's a lot of words. Does what I say, does that make sense? Makes a whole lot more sense than the way he had it asked. Yeah, this is just, it's a lot of words and kind of grossness. Just use this picture. And it's even labeled down here. Nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, nicotinic, um, the norepinephrine receptors here. So, yeah. <coughs> okay. Let me real quick just A, B, C, D, E, Primary effect of increased sympathetic stimulation, all the stuff that we've seen before should be a four. I can't tell you how many, how much time I've spent just organizing stuff in my, in the, my time at the program. Uh, there we go. There we go. Much prettier. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Cold presser reflex. A lot of this is gonna be straight from the lab. So for the hand that was placed in cold water, you should have what should have happened to blood flow. Decreased blood flow because the cold causes vasoconstriction. <clears throat> what occurs in total peripheral resistance when the hand is placed in the water. Let me pull up this lab again real quick. It's been a while since I've looked at this one. Uh, this was what week? So this was week 13 for you guys. Right. That one should be 12, I think. Week 12. Mine's a little different. I think we did ours in different order. Um, that or maybe this is like the one lab I just didn't actually save. Let's see. Are you actually response? No. We did yeah, so he just rearranged the orders that we did this lab when I took the class. We did this lab in week six. Or in week nine, sorry, week nine. So <clears throat> okay. I think you guys did less labs than we did overall, I think is what, what it boils down to. OK. Looking at the cold presser reflex, 
This one doesn't get asked about a ton, but we'll just look at it um, for continuity. So the cardiovascular, cardiovascular response, the cardiovascular response to immersion of extremity in cold water are variable in water that is zero to 15 degrees Celsius. Temperature receptors and pain receptors are responsible for the response. Temperatures above 15 degrees Celsius cause responses related to temperature regulation. The cardiovascular response to pain include an increase in sympathetic input to the heart and blood vessels and a decrease in parasympathetic input to the heart. These autonomic nervous system changes lead to an increase in cardiac output, total peripheral resistance, and mean arterial pressure. So we get an increase in all three of those. Cold receptors cause a generalized reflex vasoconstriction due with the temperature regulating center in the anterior hypothalamus. Exposure to temperatures below 15 degrees Celsius results in constriction. Uh, of resistance and capacitance vessels. Prolonged exposure will result in a secondary vasodilator effect. Continued immersion in very cold water will cause alternating vasoconstriction and vasodilation. This was to do, 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 do recovery data analysis. Okay, so you, when a hand is first placed, you get increased total peripheral resistance because <clears throat> increased resistance is due to the sympathetic activation and vasoconstriction of the vessels. So with vasoconstriction, you get an increased total peripheral resistance. <clears throat> so this next question, you use the finger pulse wave generator. I think it's supposed to say generator, but I don't remember anything like this in the experiment. Fingers pulse, use the fingers pulse. I think he's supposed to be referring to the maybe pulse, like the pulse transducer. Yeah, I couldn't figure out what he was talking about. Yeah, Hence I the, think. Huh? This is his, yeah, it's probably, he's, how does it for, I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I got the same question as you. My guess is he's probably referring to the pulse transducer. Um, but I'm not, you attach the pulse transducer finger, leave the pulse transducer attached to the finger for the entire lab exercise, remove, remove the occlumenoid, correct. But... We want to see if changes occur in heart rate, peripheral resistance, and arterial blood pressure. And the student puts a hand in cold water, calibrate. How did this infer a change in peripheral resistance? Okay, so my Let's look at so heart rate, arterial blood pressure, amplitude. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to how to answer that question the way that it's written. Um My guess, okay, so my guess is a finger pulse, probably transducer. 
How to infer a change in peripheral resistance? My guess would be that it's due to the um, due to the decrease in amplitude pulse pressure curve. That's my best guess as what it's what it's referring to because we have the data that we get is we get a we get change in blood pressure and we get change in the pulse pressure curve <clears throat> so that's that's my best guess that's just uh yeah who knows what he's what he, that's supposed to mean Anyways, pulse amplitude affects it. Decreased pulse amplitude will cause that response. You get vasoconstriction. What arm of the ANS is responsible for this response? The sympathetic. What is the effect on mean arterial pressure? Again, if blood pressure goes up, you get increased MAP. Okay. Again, you'll probably only have like one or two questions, maybe one question about this most likely like the sympathetic nervous system activates and it causes vasoconstriction like that's probably like the only question you're going to get asked about that specifically baroreflector reflexes um this is this stuff is important um so the baroreceptors directly measure My brain wants to say a different answer than that, so let me confirm. This is the point in the review where I'm not sure at all if any of that is correct. Yeah, so the baroreceptors... Let me see if it's... It should be in here. Double check. Okay, so I'm. This should be the same anywhere you are on the body, right? The bar, the barrel reflex or barrel flex. Yeah, so there's going to be two specific locations for the bear receptor. Um, so let's add a couple of things. So two locations. Oh, that's literally the next question after that. So the carotid sinus and the aortic arch are the two locations where the baroreceptors um, are located. <clears throat> and that's because they have two important jobs. So this is checking to make sure blood is coming out of the heart and then checking to make sure blood is getting to the brain. And if you don't know the carotid sinus, um, the carotid artery, when it goes up into the neck, it splits into an internal external carotid and the bear receptor sits right there. So my my gut instinct of everything of what like I want to say is that the bear receptors are measuring um, specific metabolites. especially like carbon dioxide, CO2. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how Dr. Tate teaches it because the, so the baroreceptors check blood pressure, but they also check um, stretch of the vessels. They have pH receptors, chemoreceptors, and then also the metabolites such as CO2. Any of these answer choices are technically correct. So <clears throat> I don't know what Dr. Tate taught you guys with this, 
So the metabolites thing, he definitely had that in his like lab slides that he does. Okay. So I personally like this is the one that I would pick. I would pick metabolites, typically monitoring like CO2 and kind of stuff and pH. So that's what I would pick. So um okay, so hypertensive barrel reflex. So what these receptors do. Let me see if I can find the good, good picture. Bear receptor signal. Give me a sec. I'm going to have to find it in the actual slides that I have from. So the bear receptor, remember way back when I, when I talked about the muscle spindles and how the muscle spindles are constantly sending a signal to the brain? Does that ring a bell? Uh, I've mentioned that before. Yeah. Yeah. So the baroreceptors are doing are doing that exact same thing. They're constantly sending a signal over and over and over again, letting them know like what the situation is because of how delicate the brain is. The brain needs a specific amount of oxygen all the time so that we don't die. <clears throat> oh, did I find out in the first PowerPoint? Yes, I did. Bam. <clears throat> so this is our baseline bear receptors, right? The bear receptors are checking tone of everything is everything that's going on so we have a baseline signal we're like we're sending signal sending signal sending sending signal um if we get increased blood pressure okay so that's this is what i'm going to say yeah i think i'm getting confused i'm going to do this My guess is, is he talking about chemoreceptors? Did you guys talk about chemoreceptors? Or did you yeah, speak about that? I, I, I don't remember. Okay. I just remember him mentioning it, I think, in lab. Okay. Nothing on here is... <sighs> Makes me upset. Missing such good information okay we'll just do bear receptors for time's sake so bear receptors they have a baseline they're sending their baseline signal if we suddenly get an increase in or a decrease in arterial diameter so if we decrease diameter of the artery that increases pressure increased pressure we send more signal essentially telling the body like hey blood pressure is too high so it's going to cause you know cause vasodilation cause relaxation of those things to hopefully lower the blood pressure if blood pressure gets too low <clears throat> does the opposite is gives us the lower signal a slower signal letting us know hey blood pressure is too low we're not getting enough blood up to the brain because this blood pressure is too low so let's pick up the pace, let's do cause do some vasoconstriction to make sure we're getting blood to the brain. I'm going to put this whole thing smack into and this looks like a very similar situation with what we saw above where there is a ton of words when there really doesn't need to be a ton of words. Okay. Um, the receptors are in the carotid sinus and in the aortic arch. Hypertensive baroreflex. So if we have 
blood pressure too high, we get increased baroreceptor firing. So we increase baroreceptor, let's say, signal, which then causes reduction of heart rate and cardiac output through parasympathetic activation and decreased sympathetic tone. So baroreceptors, if blood pressure is too high, baroreceptor tells the brain, brain decreases heart rate, decreases cardiac output, decreases sympathetic tone. So vasodilation happens. Blood pressure goes down. <clears throat> and then what is the response to elevated blood pressure on the following? This is just a bunch of repeat. Um, baroreceptor firing, you get increased firing rate on heart rate. Heart rate is going to go down because it's like, hey, we're getting too much blood, too much stuff is going on. We need to slow things down. What response by the ANS is primarily responsible for initiating this response? Um, this is going to be decreased SNS response, increased PNS response. What is the effect on cardiac output? You get a decrease in cardiac output. Peripheral resistance. What did it say about peripheral resistance? Well, if we have, um, I think this should be obvious, we should have Use because if we're getting, remember, so blood pressure and peripheral resistance are linked together, where um, if we have an increased peripheral resistance, we have higher blood pressure. Decreased peripheral resistance lowers blood pressure. So <clears throat> the response to elevated blood pressure is that we decrease peripheral resistance in order to lower blood pressure. And that's done, again, through vasodilation. And so again, so because this is the opposite, um, do, 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 do. yeah, the way the way that this is worded is not super clear. So we should have vasodilation. Any questions on all of this? Nobody responded, so I'm going to go that there aren't any questions currently. Uh, and how do changes to heart rate and peripheral resistance counteract the increased blood pressure? 
decreased heart rate equals decreased stroke volume equals decreased cardiac output, less blood in the vessels means, I should say less blood in the vessels at once means less pressure, decreased total peripheral resistance equals less pressure pushing on the vessels equals decreased blood pressure. Hypotensive bare reflex. Again, this is the essentially the we're going to look at the opposite reaction. Hypertensive bare reflex. Let's do this actually. Do, do, do. Let's make that like that. So then go down, make this a split. <clears throat> okay, so this first question. So you stimulated the hypotensive bariflex. So we're laying down to going standing up. When we lay down, we don't have any gravity. And when we jump up from a laying down position, this is why, especially if you've been laying down or sitting down for a while, and you get up really, really quickly, you kind of go woozy and lightheaded because that's your baroreceptor correcting your blood pressure and, and what needs to happen to keep getting blood to your brain. So <clears throat> before, so what initially occurs, so initially due to gravity, blood pressure, near the baroreceptors drops <clears throat> stimulating a baroreceptor response so again the kind of the way that they're asking this question is a little confusing um <clears throat> see if i can do these words correctly I'm not sure whether he's asking like specifically what's occurring okay so if I think it's like secondary and how this impacts blood pressure I'm going to go with this so know the impacts on venous return and how this impacts blood pressure when the baroreceptor reflex activates. So I'm going to go with what happens when it activates due to low blood pressure sensed. So once it activates, we're going to want to increase venous return. We'll get an increase in blood pressure. <clears throat> um, increased heart rate, increased peripheral resistance. And the baroreceptor signal will go back to normal. And then how did this change in blood pressure affect the baroreceptors? I'm gonna say this, how did the sudden change, I'm gonna say the sudden drop in blood pressure affect the baroreceptors? You get a decreased baroreceptor activation so slower firing rate. Yeah, due to kind of an unloading of baroreceptors in the carotid and aortic walls.
How are the afferent signals to the central nervous system impacted? So these are specifically the signals going again afferent equals to the brain. So that's going to be the baroreceptor sending the signals to the brain. So um, afferent signals are reduced with the drop in blood pressure until changes are made to reestablish equilibrium. And this will happen. This will be the um, the efferent response is the sympathetic and parasympathetic. This will be yeah, sympathetic activation and parasympathetic deactivation. <clears throat> What was the intended effect on blood pressure following standing up? Yep, decrease blood pressure. What happens to venous return? I get these. These questions, this question was already kind of answered. I'm just going to delete it. Again, I'm just going to delete these. Yeah, just I hate how this is worded. I'm going to make sure that you guys understand what it is, what the process is, and you can infer the rest of the stuff. How did the change in blood pressure affect the baroreceptors? Um, yeah, so baroreceptor signal slows down which activates the reflex to return blood pressure to the resting normal blood pressure okay how does this how does this affect action potential frequency yeah that's correct decreased action potential frequency from the baroreceptors What is the response in heart rate and peripheral pulse curve? That looks good. Yeah. Okay. I personally, I wanted to make sure I got all the words and stuff there so that you guys have them if you want to look back at it. But this is really just what you need to understand this part. Let me actually go to this. I'm going to just walk you through this reflex uh, here so <clears throat> when we have rapid changes of arterial arterial pressure the body needs to respond very quickly mostly because of the brain we want to keep prevent the brain from having way too much pressure or having not enough pressure because both of those things will jack up the brain and we need the brain to survive So, baroreceptor reflex is a stretch receptor. It is sensitive to pressure changes. I'm going to highlight on here. These are the two answer choices that I would look for. Why aren't you highlighting? I'll get rid of those. <clears throat> Stretch it, stretch or change in pressure, like tension in the vessel walls, all this kind of stuff. I'll come back and do a quick thing about chemoreceptors. I'm um, just I'm not sure if he has them here. So the nerves, I don't know if he ever covers this. The nerves that innervate the baroreceptor reflexes are the glossopharyngeal nerve go to the carotid body at the carotid sinus and the vagus nerve 
goes to the aortic baroreceptors. Sclerotic sinus is branch off of vasopharyngeal nerve, and vagus nerve. So any increase or decrease in arterial pressure will stimulate the pressure receptors, and that sends the feedback back to the central nervous system. So we have again we have those in the aortic arch and in the carotid sinus. The carotid sinus is the most sensitive. Um, let me actually add herring's nerve, branch off the glossopharyngeal nerve, herring's nerve. <clears throat> so when it is when blood pressure goes too high and we want to drop it we inhibit vasoconstricting center so that's you know we decrease sympathetic nervous system and we stimulate parasympathetic and all the stuff that comes with it here are our baroreceptors just another picture of everything kind of going on the <clears throat> carotid sinus responds to pressure between 60 and 180 millimeters of mercury. The aortic baroreceptor responds up to 210, so from 60 to 210. I don't know if he ever gave you specific numbers for that. They're not in the lab, so should be fine not knowing those. But so what we looked at, this is the sympathetic tone. <clears throat> We're sending, we have like the baroreceptors are active here in this baseline. If we increase arterial diameter, so we decrease blood pressure, it slows down. If we increase blood pressure, the signal speeds up. Don't need to know about this. <clears throat> Here's this part that we reproduced in the experiment. Blood pressure drops drastically while sitting or lying down because we're removing <clears throat> a lot of this fight against gravity that our body has to do to pump our blood. So when we stand, the arterial pressure drops in the head and especially the upper body. Um, this is the rapid reduction of pressure can lead to unconsciousness. The medical term being syncope, fainting. You ever see that word? You'll see it a lot in the future. Syncope equals fainting. Um, yeah. The arterial baroreceptors are intended to minimize variation in the pressure, so it keeps us balanced. Okay. How do we feel about baroreceptors now? Do we feel a little better than we did before? A lot better. Okay. If you end up with any questions about baroreceptors at any point, let me know. Um, <clears throat> I haven't seen... Did he ever give you any questions on quizzes or anywhere where he talked about like cinching a tie way too tight above or below the carotid sinus? Not that I ever saw. Did anybody ever hear of anything like that? Say that again. Did he have any quiz questions or anything revolved around like putting something around the neck too tight, like a tie or anything above or below the carotid sinus? Not that I can remember, no. Okay. He shouldn't ask a question like this. I'm going to say it briefly just in case he reuses questions. From the previous professor, put wearing a tie 
or tightening a tie too tight that it cuts off some circulation <clears throat> is going to have a bare receptor response. We think about it. If you cinch a tie way too tight below the carotid sinus, blood is no longer flowing across that carotid sinus. Therefore, it acts the same as a crazy drop in blood pressure. If you go below the carotid sinus, it it's like it's dropping the blood pressure significantly and all the appropriate stuff would happen. If you go above and cinch way too tight, it makes the carotid think that there is way too much pressure. Because you think if you go above it and block it off, blood is still coming from the heart, but it's just slamming into there. And the bare receptors think that your blood pressure is way too high. And it's an appropriate response will happen after that. Okay. If uh, just in case the previous professor really, really, really liked those questions. So just in case you guys see something like that, just thought I'd mention it here so that you understand what they're talking about if they have that question. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, I want to touch on chemoreceptors really quickly. Um, you also have, so besides baroreceptors, you have chemoreceptors. <clears throat> While baroreceptors focus on like that tension and like the pressure and that kind of stuff, chemoreceptors sense the chemicals. So low oxygen, too high CO2, and pH. Um, They do essentially the same thing as the baroreceptors. Um, same like nerves and everything pathway and stuff. Um, just that they're sensing the chemicals instead of the um, instead of like the instead of the pressure. And the other difference is that the chemoreceptors will stimulate the part of the brain that's for breathing to get more oxygen, release more carbon dioxide, that kind of stuff. So that's as far as I'll go into that. Um, <clears throat> I don't think you need to go, I mean, we need to go too much deeper into all of that. So, yeah. Okay, spirometry and respiratory case studies all the lung volumes, this stuff is it's going to be, you just kind of have to memorize the rough values. Um, and then if he said, he said he'd give you the equations, so that helps a lot. <clears throat> okay. Let's answer these questions. What are conducting passages? These are the passageways where the air travels in and out of the lungs. So think trachea, bronchi, uh, bronchii, the bronchi, and the bronchioles. How does this relate to dead space? Dead space equals the amount of air that is still in the passageways, but not in the lungs or breathed out. And this has to do with um, the air in these passages is considered dead space because it is not measured even though it was it left the lung itself 
Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Where does gas exchange take place in the alveoli in the air sacs? Uh, here's where I'm gonna have to probably have to start looking some stuff up. Uh, did you guys ever learn anatomical dead space versus regular dead space? Dr. Hosu mentioned it in the lab, but he didn't go super in depth. Okay, right, let me see if I can find my tweak. If I can find this this lab, I think for some reason I might be missing this lab. Let me see if I can look it up. I so I I don't know if he's gonna ask you about this, but there is physiological dead space, and then anatomical dead space. I'm gonna add these in here because I don't know if he'll if he will include these or not. <clears throat> anatomical dead space. Uh, I'm just gonna copy paste from online because it's easier. Anatomical dead space is the volume of air in the conducting zone of respiration, the nose, the trachea, the bronchi. So this is it. And then physiological dead space is the sum of anatomical dead space plus the alveolar dead space to so the volume of air in the respiratory zone so within the whole lung system that does not participate in gas exchange so i don't know if he differentiates the two or not some professors don't when i was in the class they had us do it but uh, Calculates anatomical dead space. What was the? And I, again, I don't know if he gave you guys an equation for this, but it had to calculate the anatomical dead 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 space. Uh, it's estimated at one milliliter per pound of body weight. So if somebody weighs. 200 pound patient equals 200 milliliters of dead space. I don't know if he'll have you mess with that or not. Um, if not, cool. But yeah, I did my job. Uh, how does, I don't know if it's supposed to be minute or minute. Um, ventilation from alveolar ventilation. Okay, so minute versus alveolar. This is aka total ventilation so it's the total amount of air that enters the lungs per minute um, and it's the calculation down below i'm just gonna bring this up here 
ventilation frequency, respiration rate, stupid way of saying that, uh, multiplied by the tidal volume. So, for example, if you have, uh, you breathe 500 milliliters of air per breath, 12 breaths per minute equals six liters per minute. Alveolar is the amount of air that reaches the alveoli and does gas exchange per minute. And that is <clears throat> the ventilation frequency, so respiratory rate, tidal volume minus that dead space that we just talked about before. Ooh, fun stuff. The muscles involved that contribute to inhalation. I'm going to break these into Let's see what we're going to have. Um, this isn't super clear. I guess we'll do. Um, could one of you do me a favor <clears throat> and send me the this lab that you guys have? I want to make sure that we put in what specific muscles it says in the lab because <clears throat> that's what he'll test you guys on even if it's not technically 100% accurate so i just want to make sure that i that we're filling this out that way instead of a the actual truth <laughs> <clears throat> that's the fun part separating the educational experience from the Just real world. it to you on group me sweet let me open it up I'm also going to drop, there's a picture I found just now on Google that I like for, at the bottom, it's got the like graph thing. And then I found one I liked that had it filled out with a extra like, chart. So I thought it might be helpful for everybody else too. Okay. We know the primary muscle involved is the diaphragm. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Come on. <laughs> my computer opened it and then shut it on its own <laughs> okay um, da, 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 da. Okay, the muscles that he gives okay, in the lab, it gives diaphragm and the external intercostals. 
<coughs> the primary one being the diaphragm. How does passive exhalation occur? It's called passive because the relaxation of the diaphragm allows for the abdominal pressure to push it back up, increasing pressure in the lungs, which causes exhalation. So when <clears throat> with breathing, let me give you the, the rundown. When you breathe in, <clears throat> breathing in causes the diaphragm contracts and pulls downwards. Essentially what it does is it creates a negative space, meaning that it's increasing the volume in this area and if we increase volume without you know putting more stuff in it that decreases pressure so by decreasing the pressure inside of our lungs that means our the inside of our lungs are at a lower pressure than the air that's around us that's outside so by creating that negative space it forces air to go from high pressure to low pressure. So it goes from outside of our mouths, inside, into the lungs. So that is how inspiration occurs. Now, exhalation, the diaphragm will relax. And as it relaxes, all of our organs and everything down here, as well as our abdominal wall, create pressure inside of our abdomens. And that pressure is then going to push on the diaphragm. As the diaphragm relaxes, it pushes that diaphragm back up, which decreases the total volume of the lungs. Decreasing the total volumes means pressure is increased, which means then pressure is higher inside of the lungs than the outside air, so air rushes out. Does that explanation make sense to everybody? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see if this says anything about forced. Okay, to go. I don't know how deep he wants to go with this, so I'm going to go with like the main ones. So, forced exhalation. So we have our abdominal muscles, um, the diaphragm. I guess you say. So relaxes, relaxes, increases intra-abdominal pressure. Um, pushes diaphragm upwards. And then we also have our accessory muscles of respiration, uh, which are the internal intercostals, also the scalenes, and technically SCMs. That's as far as I'll go. Um, let me just double check, make sure I got those accessory muscles correct. Yep, SCM. Uh, that doesn't include the intercostals. Those are encountered as abdominal muscles. <clears throat> um, 
Tech major, minor. Ones that you'll focus on, these guys are the main ones you'll get asked about. But. Uh, next question, how is intrapulmonary pressure related to the stage of ventilation? This is what we were just, I was just talking about, about how um, if the diaphragm is relaxed, it contracted versus relaxed. So diaphragm contracted equals decreased thoracic cavity pressure. Air rushes in inhalation. Diaphragm, diaphragm relaxed equals increased thoracic cavity pressure. Air rushes out. Exhalation. <clears throat> How is intrapulmonary pressure changed during each stage of ventilation? Muscle contraction. See above for all the muscles. How do obstructive and restrictive disorders affect airflow? So, mm, obstructive versus restrictive. Obstructive disorders can't get air out. Restrictive can't get air in. Common disease. Um, let's see what. Do you guys recall any of the diseases that they. Uh, the main one in lab that he talked about was obstructive uh, asthma. And then restrictive. I don't remember what he said for restrictive. Oh, finally. It's like inflammation. Just yeah, okay. So obstructive. fibrosis. Yes. Uh, conditions. You get asthma. Big one with asthma is you notice you get wheezing. COPD. <sighs> uh, let's do this instead. COB COPD is technically like an umbrella term. <laughs> the ones that are included in... I don't know, again, I don't know how deep to go into each of these. Um, asthma, bronchitis, emphysema, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis are the ones that are mentioned in the lab. Asthma due to inflammation of the lining of the airways and heavy mucus secretions. Wheezing sound. Did he ever talk about like pink puffer and blue bloater? Not in our lab, he didn't.
So I'm going to cover it. I have a feeling like he might throw this in as part of it. Oh, gross. That's not a very nice picture. Make it clear. There we go. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> chronic bronchitis, I'll just, just put down picture, emphysema, same thing, see picture. So these guys, so asthma, chronic bronchitis, emphysema, if you ever see these emphysema, um, essentially, the, the lungs get super inflated and they can't constrict anymore. Um, a lot of like smokers and stuff tend to have emphysema as well as it's a genetic condition. You have a lack of a specific um, protein. It's like an anti-trypsin protein that um, kind of keeps everything together. So you get hyperinflation. Chronic bronchitis, um, lots of cough, lots of stuff going on, and you tend to be like get a cyan cyanotic. So emphysema, you're struggling to get air out because the lungs are too big. Chronic bronchitis, you can't get air out because there's a whole bunch of gunk and stuff going on. Um, if it comes up, chronic bronchitis is known as a blue bloater. Emphysema is a pink puffer. Those are the main ones. And then cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis um, is a genetic condition that affects a protein. And this essentially so mucus that is supposed to be um, slippery and that protects the airways um, is not and blocks airways. Okay. Restrictive, what conditions do they give for restrictive? They give uh, oh geez, pulmonary fibrosis, hyphosis, scoliosis, obesity, neuromuscular diseases like ALS, muscular dystrophy. So basically, the lungs can't expand. They don't give a lot of specific details on those. So hopefully, just knowing the conditions is enough. Kyphosis being like hunched over. Um, thoracic spine is very bent forward. This happens a lot with like osteoporosis, scoliosis, um, spine is lateral, prevents lungs from expanding fully due to muscle, muscle limitations. Okay. FEV1, -E 
this is the total amount of air you can expel in one second. So it should be 70 to 83 percent of vital capacity. <clears throat> so this is kind of with with obstructive disorders, this goes down. The FEVT. This is just referring the T stands for. Stands for time, so the same as FEV one. I should say the same test as FEV one. Just with a longer um, time specified. So it can be two, three, four, five, six, etc. seconds. And so when you compare the two, can you interpret the ratio of so ratio? We're looking for a ratio of kind of 75%. And comparing them to decide if they have a lung condition slash disease. So this just it's a math equation. It should give you that number. You take the FEV1 over the FAVT. So however, FEVT, um, so can depend uh, depending on how long it takes to fully exhale. So ratio seventy five percent when comparing them to decide if they have a lung condition or disease. So this is like what they check check with asthma. When I was growing up, I had asthma pretty bad. So I did like 30 or 40 of these tests, the spirograph tests. I had to go and blow and they checked my FEV1 and FEVT to determine like the severity of the, the condition. So <clears throat> that's what this ratio is telling us. We want a ratio of at least of 75%. So 75% of our total exhale of uh, vital capacity should occur within the first one second. And then finally, boop, boop. And then given values, can you calculate the lung volumes and lung capacities? So it's just this guy right here, all that's going on there. All right. We did it. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, I'm going to just gonna make a new copy. Stop sharing. Let me upload this now. Any questions, comments, concerns 
about all the material we just covered. I think I'm good. Could I just have somebody, if somebody could um, download and open the file just to make sure that it all uploaded correctly before I log off? Because after I log off, I'm going to bed. So. <laughs> Doesn't look like it did.